Our next speaker is uh, Rod Dearden, who was just up a few minutes ago to help introduce Secretary LaHood. He's the executive director of the Mineta Transportation Institute, and he's also chairman of, the, of our U.S. High-Speed Rail Advisory Board. He was uh, been executive director of the Mineta Transportation Institute since 1995, <clears throat> and he's known as the father of modern transit service in Silicon Valley. And he has a train station named after him, which I think is a great honor. And we're happy to have you here, Rod Dearden. Well, we're going to uh, have a look primarily at the California project to bring you up to date. I get the pinch hit for Dan Richard and Jeff Morales, who are back home fighting the battles and getting that uh, first bid ready to open. And I'll touch on that uh, during the conversation. The reason why I'm uh, involved in politics, have been for the last almost 50 years, is because of this. I'm an environmentalist. I'm an accredited, tree-hugging, animal-loving environmentalist. And uh, well, I'm not, a, I'm not an unthinking one. I have an MBA and I've run, I've run companies. Uh, so I understand the need for viability. But I am very concerned, as did both the secretary and the administrator mention the climate change issues, uh, that we're leaving an unsustainable planet to our youngsters. And the reason is because we're not communicating effectively with our populations. Now, this uh, survey was done uh, for the United Nations by the University of Maryland about five years ago. And it asked how high a priority should climate change be for your governments? Well, when you look over at the left-hand side, it's hard for you to see that, I'm sorry, but you'll notice that it's the leadership countries in the world, China, Japan, the European uh, leadership countries are all over there with high, high concern uh, for the issue. When you come over to the right-hand side, well, the third to the worst is Iraq. There's a good group to hang out with. The second to the worst is the Palestinian territories. And there's a leadership group. But the worst in the world, and the world knows this, is the United States of America, with less than uh, a five unit or 50% uh, concern about climate change and a desire to have their governments do something about it. Well, that's an atrocity, folks. I, I can tell you that I was at a, at a conference. When you get old, you get discovered. You get to go around and talk. I gave a, a talk to the Pacific Rim ministers of transportation about five years ago in, uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong. After the talk, which is, I think, halfway decent, uh, the uh, Minister of Transportation from Pakistan stood up and he said, how dare you come here and talk to us about climate change when the United States is 4% of the world's population, creating 30% of the greenhouse gases. In fact, we're creating the same amount of greenhouse gases with 300 million people as is China with 1.4 billion people. Well, that can't continue. You talk about us boycotting Iran for nuclear weapons, the world's going to boycott us for causing the planet to be untenable. So we've got to do something about it. And the way to do something about it is to move to electrically powered transportation and other kinds of power too, but especially transportation, which is what we can control. Now this is why we're looking at high-speed rail to solve that problem. You see cars way over on the right-hand side. This is a measure of grams of CO2 per passenger mile, per seat kilometer, whatever you want to call it. Cars are terrible. Airlines are not much better. Buses are only a little better than airlines. But then when you get to electrically powered steel wheel on rail transportation systems, the unit of uh, pollution goes way down with light rail transit and high speed rail way down there at the bottom. That's where we have to be. That's what the rest of the world is doing now. And the rest of the world, as you saw in the first graph, is frantic about climate change 
and they're ready to compete in terms of getting product to the market and people to the marketplace. Let's, let's, uh, you've seen these before. Let's run through these real quick and pick the raisins out of the, out of the pudding and realize that there are 30 operating high-speed rail lines in the world right now. Every industrialized country, most emerging countries, have high-speed rail except one, the United States. Of course, we're always right and the whole world is wrong. Japan's the leader, 64. There's their system, 1,500 miles. That's their 200 mile an hour train, the S700. Korea, right behind them, fine new system. Taiwan has a fine system. <clears throat> they made the mistake of creating their stations out in the farmlands, so they're not carrying a, a payload yet, but they're rapidly densifying around those stations, and they have the core of a wonderful, uh, profitable system in the future. That's their look. That's about San Francisco to LA. Hmm. That's their 200 mile an hour train. China is eating our lunch as we sit here. Two, two tiered high speed rail system, one for freight and passengers at 120 miles an hour. They're gonna get people to work, product to the market, more efficiently than any country in the world. And then the 360 kilometer per hour true high speed rail, and they're up to 8,000 kilometers of that built in the last 10 years while we sit around counting our toes. That's the, the Chinese rail system, over 100,000 kilometers, double uh, phased, two different tiers, and all being converted gradually to electric power. That's their true high-speed system on the East Coast. Europe, that's what their 2020 system is going to look like, and much of that is done now, especially down in Spain. Now, we're told that Spain is on the verge of bankruptcy. They're having terrible times with their banks and so on, but they're building high-speed rail because it stimulates their economy. Isn't there a lesson there for us somewhere? That's the uh, Spanish system, their 200 mile an hour system based on the German platform's lower right hand corner. That's the, what we just saw, that's the future. That's the French 357 mile per hour system. They take the proven technology off that, put it on that which runs around the countryside in France each day at over 200 miles an hour. There's a German system, that's a genesis for a whole lot of other systems in the world, lower right hand corner, outstanding program. I'm Italian, so I'm proud of the Japanese, pardon me, the Italian system. The, uh, the Italian system, by the way, now is operated by a private corporation, the chair of which is the uh, president of Ferrari. And of course, he repainted all the trains Ferrari red. That's our system. Now, the only difficulty with that is that most of it isn't operating. But it's a wonderful uh, basic network. It's the approved 13 uh, assist, uh, route system that has been confirmed by Congress and approved by the Secretary of Transportation. Blue lines are the incremental upgrade, 120 mile an hour. The green lines are the 200 mile an hour ultimate systems. Uh, the uh, portions of the Northeast Corridor are running at 150 miles an hour, averaging 81 miles an hour and getting 160% of the operating cost out of the fare box. You can do that at 81 miles an hour average. Think what we can do in terms of capturing the market between uh, cities of four, three, four, five, six hundred miles if we're going 200 miles an hour. Those, those 200 mile an hour systems are the Northeast Corridor, the system that Joe mentioned uh, from uh, Chicago down to St. Louis, the Florida system, Texas T-Bone, and the California system. That's the same thing only in a list. The golden rod looking are the 200 mile an hour. The others are the incremental upgrade systems. That's the same thing that shows where the money's gone. And very, we're very proud in California to have received 
the uh, largest amount of money, and it was primarily because we were ready. Let me go on and tell you how ready. This is why in California we have to do it. We're going to double in population. We're going to move the population of New York into California in the next 40 years. You can imagine how uncomfortable that's going to make California unless we do something dramatic regarding getting people to work and product to the market. 96, we created the High Speed Rail Authority. Five from the governor, two from the assembly, two from the Senate. It spent over a billion dollars now doing the largest environmental evaluation preliminary engineering in the history of the United States. Uh, the uh, environmental progr uh, program level environmental is uh, certified. Project level environmental is being certified now. And the first project will go under construction in June of this year. That's the route. Uh, the early construction will be in that area from uh, Merced down to Bakersfield. And that will be about $6 billion with the first element of that ready to open in the next month. Those are the bidders, the, the, the uh, confirmed bid teams that are bidding on that first $1.5 to $2 billion from Merced down through Fresno. Uh, these are civil work only, uh, great separations, uh, top of rail construction. And you can see who they are, what they're doing, and the, the uh, slides are going to be retained by the U.S. High Speed Rail Association in the computer on the website for you to refer to if you'd like to. Those bids are in now. They're, uh, they're being reviewed and uh, uh, are being evaluated now for the quality of the bid. And in two weeks, they're going to open the, the cost portion of the bid. And the bid then will be let on the basis of about 70% concern for cost and about 30% for the quality of the bid proposal. And then there will be uh, five of those bids in succession from Merced down to Bakersfield, one and a half, uh, half a billion to a billion dollars each, with the ultimate uh, bid being for railing the whole thing, putting in the ties and rails uh, from uh, Merced down to Bakersfield. That $6 billion will be the first construction on what ultimately will be a $68 billion construction project from uh, Anaheim to San Francisco. And then an additional $30 billion will be added to that as we go on down to San Diego from LA and up to Sacramento from Merced. This is the uh, phasing of the project. Once we get that Central Valley portion done, we'll, we'll do work on the Merced uh, to uh, the uh, San Fernando Valley, and then uh, then Merced down to San Jose, and then the bookends from San Jose to San Francisco and LA to Anaheim. I'll not go through that in detail because you can go back to it if you like. Now this is the California project in a little more fun way. This is an animation, but it shows you how it's going to look. That's the route. A route certified in an environmental clearance, so there's no doubt anymore. That's the Anaheim Station, which the city of Anaheim is going to build with their own money. You'll leave the Anaheim Station, head on up through the congested area of South LA, down through LA Union Station, in a trench up through Bakersfield or Burbank, up through the high desert, Palmdale down through the Central Valley. Central Valley is flat and easy to build in, where we'll get the best bang for the buck. And it's the fastest growing area in the United States. It has the highest construction unemployment. So for a lot of reasons, it's the right place to build. There's the downtown station in San Jose. We see infill development there. We'll see a little more of that later. Then up through the peninsula to San Francisco, to San Francisco's humongous new Trans Bay Terminal. About $4 billion invested in creating a terminal and station adjacent densification. All of that densification occurring on top of the terminal building, which is underground. Then up from San Diego to Union Station. 
Now, we in Northern California have to remind people here that Southern California is really a desert. It shouldn't have been settled at all. They're just taking our water from the north. But since we've got them, we've got to take care of them. So it ties together an area which is now at a, just a little over 40 million people that will be almost 70 million people by the turn of the century. That's Fresno, infill development. Then up through Merced, Stockton, and into Sacramento, the state's capital. That's their station, which is going to be surrounded on the old Southern Pacific main rail yard with infill development. Now, I want to show the animation of what's going to happen at one of the 26 stations on the California system. This is what's there now at the downtown Deridon station. We already have four commuter rail, three commuter rail and Amtrak service. We already have light rail going in a tunnel under the station. And then we're going to see the um, new station go in over the top for high speed rail. We're going to see commuter rail, the Caltrain commuter rail, and the light rail, high speed rail system. In a, it'll probably be a different system uh, station than that, but something like that. And then there's going to be about $4 billion worth of privately funded infill development that all goes into local tax base. And a BART line will go under all of that at about 100 feet. So you'll have four levels, BART, light rail, commuter rail, and high-speed rail stacked up on top of each other with an interconnect, as we'll see now, to the airport. Now this is what's planned in the, in the South Bay area in terms of interconnect. And this is where the Manetta Institute studies are going now. That's commuter rail. We have another inner city commuter rail that goes on up through Oakland to the state, uh, state capital in Sacramento. Then we have BART, which is there now. Then we have BART under construction now to the downtown station. Then we have light rail built now, built now under construction. That'll be about ultimately 140 miles of electrically powered light rail focused on the downtown station, feeding in and out of the downtown station and the airport. Now this is funded through half cent sales tax voted by the people of Santa Clara County or Silicon Valley. Buses are all, all over the place. Can't show the routes because they're too dense. High speed rail. You can see that the high speed rail station feeds right in to the airport. Now that's the airport uh, people mover. It's, uh, it's an automated guideway transit system planned to feed out of two train stations. Once will be primarily, one will be primarily commuter, the other will be primarily intercity rail. All you have to do is check your bags when you leave your hometown in the Central Valley, Merced or Fresno, check them to Paris, and they go right on through to Paris without having to touch those bags again. And all you have to do is get off the train, walk across, across the platform, get on the automated guideway transit system, go out to your, your um, loading location at the airport, hop on your plane, and pick your bags up in Paris. Unless they went to Timbuktu, that is. <laughs> now, LA, the same kind of a thing. I'm going to skip through because it's just too big. That's 11 million people in that slide all focused on the downtown Union Station with the catalyst being the high-speed rail system. 
Laid over that is the Amtrak program, all focused on the downtown Union Station. San Diego, the same thing. Now, this last is the size of the project. It is humongous. And I'm not going to go through it except to tell you it's the largest single construction project attempted in the United States history. Anytime you can put 32,000 engineers to work instead of having them on welfare, that's a good thing. <laughs> Let's hear it for the engineers off welfare. <laughs> Let me end my comment by saying that um, as the secretary and administrator mentioned, it takes vision and then it takes people saying what the vision is over and over again. In the 1930s, people began talking about a Golden Gate Bridge in California. Everybody was against it. The mayor of San Francisco was against it. The governor was against it. Many of the legislators, Sierra Club, no, you can't put a bridge, bridge across that. Costs way too much money. No, don't want to do that. Well, a few people kept at it. There was no money for it. Few people kept at it. Now we have the Golden oh, It had 2,300 lawsuits against it at one time. Now there's a Golden Gate Bridge, and we can't imagine doing without that iconic structure. Well, we're doing the same thing now. We've had the naysayers. They're dwindling. They're dwindling rapidly, primarily because you're out there sharing your vision. So let's go out and multiply ourselves, be determined, carry that vision, and build this system. Thank you.